Good morning, everybody. This is the moment of the show where I go ahead and press that go live button. We let all the notifications go out. A little bit more on notifications in a few minutes here. For those of you watching on replay, go ahead and use that slider down below until you see this graphic go away. And, uh, that's when everything takes off live. If I edit this out, then we lose all the cool stuff like the chat replay and a bunch of other things. And we don't want to do that. So I'll just kind of leave this up, hang around for a few minutes. And when the clock reaches 12 o'clock, I reach over and click a button and say, Hey, y'all. Happy Sunday to everybody. Hope everyone is doing well. Hope uh, everybody's hanging in and uh, everybody is healthy. So, um, yeah, the big thing going on. We'll get into that in just a couple of minutes. Before we do, let's go ahead and go down the list and uh, see who's joining us today. Uh, we have Richard Poulin hanging in today, Mr. William Stauffer, Dave Leonard in Danville, California. Yeah, it's pretty smoky down there too. Uh, Steve Thomas checking in from Arkansas, Dave Krause, Mr. Kevin Ells down there in South Africa, uh, Steve Late over in the UK. Yes, sir. Uh, Ice Cream 62 over in Italy. Everybody here is healthy and doing just fine. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Jeff down there in Arizona at JMJ Love Dance. Michael Mezalik. I have not forgotten you want to chat with me. I have time this afternoon. If you do, I'll hook up with you over on the Facebooks. Uh, let's see. Kurt Briegel in Wisconsin where the bears run wild. Yeah, I'm out in Oregon where the hippies run wild bear. So, there's always that. Let's see. Uh, Steve Nealon over at Harniel Media, sponsor of Mark Lindsay CNC, my webmaster and just general all around good friend. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ayal Peleg checking in from Israel. And Mr. Ronald Ledger over there in Quebec. Let's see. Uh, Mike Smith. From Soggy Bottom, Florida. Really kind of makes its own joke, doesn't it? Sorry, Mike, I had to. Jeff Rozak from Edgewater. Mm, yeah, okay, that's all right. Let's see. <laughs> uh oh, it suddenly jumped on me. There we are. Jonathan W., the man, the myth, the legend. Pulled off another one. I watched your video on the wiring on the Duramax this morning. Man, if y'all aren't subscribed to Jonathan, get over there and do it now and check this guy out. That's his latest uh, video on the Duramax is proof when I say if he can't fix it, it ain't broke. Because, I mean, I really thought that thing was gone, Jonathan. Let's see. Uh, Mr. Michael Bell. Mr. Bob Lee, my electrical guru. Over there at uh, Bob Lee's Wood Shop and other things. Edwin Thatcher over there in Louisville, Ohio. Steve Martin in Manchester. Lester Mitchell at St. Lucia. Wow, okay. Uh, Michael Johnston, if I'm not mistaken. You're in the nation of my forefathers, Scotland. Uh, Charles Lawrence checking in. Richard Canton from Michigan. John Sautier, uh, Jeff over at Woody Wan, and the other Jeff, Resorter66 over in Ohio, and Marcel Pro. How are you, is everybody doing today? Uh, I hope you're doing well. I hope everybody is safe. Thank you, Dave Gilbert. Hey, hi there. Ho there. Let me scroll back up here to the top. Uh, Richard and William and uh, Steve, Late, and a few others 
are asking about, um, are we safe from the fires? Yes, we are. We are safe from the fires. Uh, they were very close to us. In fact, that's what I was going to talk about uh, at first. And um, the reason why I did not have a video this week, um, make sure I'm sharing here. This is a satellite photo that was taken on Friday. And this is uh, the state of Oregon. This line here, I don't know if you can see it or not. That's the Oregon coast. This line down here is the California border. And we live right in this area here. This satellite overlay is showing the smoke from the fires. It has since changed, and the smoke is now filling in these areas here. As you can see, the entire western portion of Oregon is basically affected by these fires. And we had some very serious fires. Um, let me go ahead over to the next picture. Uh, this is a little crop of that area. We had a fire down to our south, south of Medford, and a fire up to our north. And you can kind of see this little green area here. That's where we live. We live in right in this green box in here somewhere. For a little bit of reference, this is 10 miles away from us, and this is about 12 to 15 miles away from us. I had to back up. I thought it was around 20, but it's about 12 to 15, depending upon which area we're talking about. Uh, these fires were quite serious. And in fact, you know, uh, as it sits right now, the conservative estimate is 600 homes lost and 100 commercial buildings and businesses. So that's over 700 structures just gone. Now, the reason I don't have a video is obviously watching these evacuation areas and evacuation reports. But when you look in the area of White City where I live, this fire here is the one that we were concerned about. It would have to come through another town to get to us. But that is not unprecedented. That that it things like that have happened in the fat past we had extremely strong gusty winds sustained winds of 20 to 30 miles an hour with gusts in the 40 and 50 mile per hour range and when that happened this area down here is all populated you'll see that there are two cities named right here um that were right in the middle of the fire. More than half of each of these towns burned. So there are a lot of people that are still evacuated. And as you can see, this is this picture is dated September 9th. There are still a lot of people evacuated that cannot get home and don't even know if their homes are still there. This is an example of what I'm talking about. Um, we're talking about entire neighborhoods completely removed from the map. And it's just been total devastation in these towns. This is a major highway here that runs north to south. This is an interstate freeway the main artery running north and south to get in and out of the valley. And the devastation was just widespread. This is the fire that's about 12 to 15 miles to the south of us. Now, we happen to luck out in that both fires were moving away from us, both to the northwest. Then we had a wind shift and it shifted to the east slightly, then the winds just died down. And the firefighters have been able to get a, a better handle on it. This is the view of our backyard as normal. This was before I started working on the shed. And you can see all the junk I had drug out from behind my other shed, working on this area over here before I got started working on it. 
This picture was taken yesterday. Um, you can see how thick the smoke is here. It visibility is about a quarter of a mile, and it the air quality is in the hazardous category. So basically, they're trying to warn people to just stay inside because you you just can't breathe if you go outside for more than two or three minutes your eyes are watering and it is hard it is difficult to breathe now it's supposed to start changing tonight but it's been this way for about four days so that's one reason why i don't have a video is the constant watching of the uh of the evacuation that status and the um, just the smoke. I haven't been able to physically get outside and do any work. So that's where we sit right now. So <laughs> it's just, um, it's really something. Now in this, um, in the description box of this video, I've put a link to a gentleman who is up north of me. His name is uh, Jason, and his YouTube channel is The Northwest Sawyer. If you want to get a little bit of an idea on what folks here up and down the this state are going through right now, he's up outside of Portland, which is 270 miles to the north of me. And he posted a video last night that was basically a timeline of when they discovered there was a fire heading towards them and how they evacuated. And it's really, he runs a sawmill, a portable sawmill, wood miser. Um, I think he's got the, I want to say he's got the 35, but he's, he, he, was able to get up and rescue some of his stuff. And as of the time of posting that video, the fire had stopped 100 feet away from his house. So, um, but it's a very interesting video and I put a link to it uh, down in the description of this video. So, let me just say that, um, let me go ahead and just end that there. And uh, just say, yes, we are safe. All of the fires have been moving away from us. So we're okay. But there are a lot of friends and family who no, none of our immediate family lost anything. They were evacuated, but they were, have been allowed to return to their homes. But a few friends lost everything. So that's what has been occupying our time for about the past week. So... Um, let's just go ahead and end that discussion there unless anybody has any questions and I'm more than willing to uh, answer any questions you have about that. So with no video really to talk about, I guess, um, I, I guess we can just go ahead with an open Q and A and, uh, see if anybody has any questions about, uh, Vectric or, uh, CNC or anything else here. Um, looking down, and it's looking like all of the questions are fairly recent. So uh, let's see here. Jeffrey Stewart wants to know an imported vector is scaling to over two inches deep of a cut, and nowhere is that depth of cut set. Do you know where I can find and correct that setting? Okay. I'm going to assume that you're talking about a V-carve uh, and using a V-bit because a like a profile or a pocket tool path would require you to set a depth. So on a V-carve tool path, you will need to set a flat depth. It's the second blank down at the top of the V-carve tool path form you will need to set how deep you want that to cut. I have a video. It's part three. Excuse me. Boy. I did do a video on this. I um, It was part three of the V-Carving for Absolute Beginners series. I'll go ahead and link that. 
in the description after we finish live here i've just made a uh just made a note to post that and it explains how to set a flat depth how to use a larger area clearance tool and uh basically what's happening is that v bit with that v shape if you don't set a flat depth it's going to plunge as deep as it needs to plunge to clear out the area inside the vectors you're selecting. So if you have a large area inside those vectors, it wants to go through and cut everything out to achieve that V shape. By setting it to a flat depth, you tell it how deep to cut, and then you assign different tools to clear out the center rather than using that V bit to go back and forth and try to clear everything out. So. I hope that answers your question, Jeffrey. Uh, let's see. Candy Junction says, very smoky here in Washington State. Glad you're safe. Several of my family in Oregon are evacuated. Yeah, I things aren't going so well up in Washington either. It's kind of intense this year. Here's hoping uh, you and yours uh, are all safe and everybody comes out of this okay. Excuse me. <coughs> Uh, Resorter 66, Jeff wants to know, could you show how to use the angle measure tool? I can't seem to figure out how to use it and get a degree angle to show. Okay, let's see. The angle measure tool. Let me first go over here to Aspire and we will make sure I'm screen sharing. I am. Okay, the angle measure tool. Are you referring to this measure tool here? If you are, what I'll need to do is, let's go ahead and do, just draw a quick rectangle out here. Close that. And I'll, the angle measure tool is basically start at one point, move to another point. So if I wanted to measure the angle between that bottom corner and my x0, y0, I just place the crosshair right over the point that I want to measure and then look up here at the angle. And it's going to give me the angle from one point to the next, which in this time would be 22.488, so not quite 22 and a half degrees. If that's not what you were talking about, then let me know in the chat there, Jeff. But angle measure, the measure tool just gives you a readout of distance, angle, and distance in X, distance in Y. So if that's not what you meant, please let me know. Let me go back here to y'all. Let's see now. Um... Come down here to Jeff at JMJ Love Dance. What is your opinion regarding how fast to depth to set the plunge rate? Is slow better or does that add heat and rubbing on the bit? Does it matter if it's a V bit or an end mill? Um, it doesn't really matter whether it's a V bit or an end mill. I tend to set my plunge rate at right at half of my feed rate. So Sometimes I will bump that up. It just depends on what bit it is. And I know that's not really a definitive answer. But the smaller the bit, the slower I tend to run them. Because it reduces bit breakage. Because you're talking about a very tiny bit. Um, on an eighth inch bit, for example, I'll set my feed rate at 50, my plunge rate at 30. On a quarter inch end mill, I'll set my feed rate. I'll start out at, say, 60 and set my plunge rate to 30 or 40. So right around half of my feed rate. Now, there are times that I do want my plunge rate to be equal to my feed rate. Um, if I'm just cutting straight through a piece of uh, material, a uh, sheet of plywood or something like that, and I'm just doing a profile cutout, I'll set my feed rate at 60 and my plunge rate at 60 just because it doesn't really matter. I'm going to ramp in that that uh, plunge move. So I might as well go ahead and 
plunge it at the same as my uh, feed rate. But more often than not, my uh, plunge rate is half of my feed rate. Let's see here. Um, Lester Mitchell, I'm new to the whole CNC and Vectric desktop program. Welcome aboard, Lester. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Uh, let's see. Kurt Briegel says, I will start using the technique for taping down material using CA and accelerator. Do you just sand off the overspray of the accelerator when done? Um, generally speaking, I don't really concern myself with that all that much. If I'm going to be applying a finish, I'll sand it anyway. So um, th that accelerator evaporates pretty quickly. So by the time it's finished cutting, it's evaporated. And just with any woodworking project, um, you're going to do some finish sanding before you start painting or applying a top coat or stain anyway. So I haven't noticed any problems at all. I'm not getting any fish eyes or uh, any spottiness or any orange peel in those areas, if that's what you're asking. So it's, it, it basically, I sand anyway. So, and I haven't noticed any issues. Let's see. Um, Mike Smith in the tool database, how do I set different materials for my feeds and speeds? You know what? I don't know that I ever did a video on that or not, but let's go ahead and bring that up. We'll go ahead and take that back here and let's look at the tool database. Now, if you notice here, if you go to tool paths, you have a tool database for material, tool database for machine, and just your tool database. Go into the tool database. Now, if you want to set up a material, let me see what categories I have here. Okay, I have hardwood and MDF. Let's say I wanted to get real specific and I want to create a material database for maple. I can just come up here to this icon, open the material management dialog, and right now I have hardwood selected. I want to add one. I want to add material to a database. Then it says new material. I'll come down here and I'll enter maple. Then apply. Click OK. And I now have a new material for maple that I can choose from the list. And from there, I can go into all of my tools and I can set feeds and speeds that I use for maple. Let's, for instance, we have a quarter inch end mill here. And I'm going to select this end mill and put it into my new maple category. What I'll do is look down here. The units is inches. It is an end mill. The diameter is quarter of an inch. The end mills I use are two flutes. And I'm going to copy the settings from this tool from the hardwood category. I'll click copy and that sets the pass depth, step over, speeds and feeds. Now I can go in and make these adjustments for when I'm cutting maple. Let's say I want to reduce my pass depth and go for a sixteenth of an inch for some reason, 0625. I can go back and change this later. Okay, so now I've set my pass depth to cut a sixteenth of an inch per pass. Step over, I'll leave it 40%. I, I very rarely go above 40% for a step over. My spindle is not controlled by software. So I tend to run my router at about 16,500 RPM. So that's what I've set it for. And my feed rate, I'm going to leave that at 60 inches per minute and the plunge rate at 30 inches per minute. I'll click apply. And now that tool in the maple category is set up. 
if I go back to the hardwood category, that same tool has a different pass depth than it does in the maple category. You see how that works there? So you can set up a different material, a new material, by just clicking on the Open Material Management dialog, this icon right here, and you can set up a different machine with this dialog here. Then you can go through and as you add tools, and if you look here, I'm in the maple category, if you look down here, all of these icons for these tools are kind of ghosted out. But this one here is in focus. That's because that tool has been added to the maple category and none of the others have because I just created it. So now I can go through and I can change feeds and speeds for just maple. And when I know I'm going to be carving in maple, I can switch over to that tool database and all my feeds and speeds and depths of cuts, past depths, etc. are set. So I hope that answers that question. So let me get back over here to where y'all are. Whoops, am I still screen sharing? Nope, okay. Let me get back over here to where y'all are. I hope that answers your question. So, let's see. Um, Lester Mitchell, I work at the prison and I'm tasked with learning and being able to at least teach inmates how to. Well, cool. <laughs> cool. Very, very nice. Okay, let's see. Uh, Richard Poulin wants to know, could you do a small example of a swept profile? I'm having a problem adjusting the cutting depth. Um, okay, on a swept profile, let me bring a spire back up. I'm going to assume you are talking about the... Uh, molding tool path I believe it is so let's um, I'll need a profile to do a molding tool path let's go ahead and go back over to create we'll create a profile here and I'll close that and I'll just Draw a line, polyline. I'll go ahead and come down like so. I'm just inventing as I go here. And we'll do that. Space bar to accept the line. Then I'll come in with the trim tool. Get rid of those. Zoom in. And now, let's see. Yeah, I'll come in. Select this, go into node editing, and delete span. Oops, not what I meant to do. Hit the wrong one. Oh, come on, Mark. You act like you've never done this before. Delete span. Okay. Come out of node editing. All right. So, let me go over here to the molding tool path. And I want to select my drive rail, hold down shift. This is the profile I want to machine. And I want to reverse the direction because I want to cut from the inside. So we'll reverse direction and reverse direction. It's not going to let me cut to the inside. Okay, that's fine. Um... Hmm. Yeah, I went and made them mismatched. Cut depth exceeds thickness, and that's not going to help any. Let me cut this down. Let me go in here. Come on. And we'll delete that span. And let's just use that. close come out of note editing mark I'm not good on the fly 
<laughs> there we go. Okay. Now, uh, when you're talking about cut depth, you look at this. Um, the cut depth on this is a little more than a half inch because it's a long profile. So what I'm going to have to do is go in, select the bit, and let's go back to my hardwood database. And if I want to use a, well, okay, I've already got a quarter inch ball nose. Looking at the pass depth, that's what you'll want to adjust. So if I'm going to try to cut that profile with this pass depth, it's going to go pretty deep. So let me go ahead and change that down to, now just for this demonstration, I'll go ahead and make it a uh, sixteenth of an inch. But I don't want to do that in this screen. I almost made a big mistake. That would change it permanently. I want to edit that bit. There we go. And we have a pass depth, quarter inch ball nose, 05. Hmm. Must be a different bit. I don't get it. Okay. Let's say I want 0625. That other one was not this way. I must have been doing something else. And we'll click OK. That should give me several passes. It won't try to cut that entire half inch at once. Let me calculate it and we'll see. And I can go over here and take a look. And... Yes, there are several, and this is one way of reading your um, toolpaths over here. Let me kind of rock it back and then go back down to that corner here. The light blue is a Z move. Okay, so each light blue is a Z axis plunge, and every green is a retract. So I, if I understand what you're trying to say, and that gives me that profile, which kind of really is rotten, but that's okay. If I understand what you're trying to say, the controlling of the plunge depth of the, uh, of the tool path should be controlled by the pass depth of that cutter. So, unless I got that wrong, and that's not what you were asking, of course. Um, yes, closed vectors are always on the outside. Yes, Mike. Okay, um, let's see. Jeff over at Resorter 66, the measure tool next to the bitmap trace icon. Let me take a look at that. Here, hold on just one second, please. Like I said, I'm not very good on the fly. And let's get this to where I can share. All right, make sure I'm sharing. Yes, I am. Okay, next to the bitmap trace icon, which is, that's add dimensions, um, Jeff. You're adding dimensions, that's basically an illustration. You're looking at an angle dimension. We'll click this, and we'll start with the base point. Then again, I'll come out here to that center point and then to this corner and then click again right there. That's giving me the angle from where this line, this vector crosses that center point to where it meets that corner is 9.1 degrees. Let me undo that, and we'll do another one. I want to measure the angle from this corner. This is my uh, pivot point. I want to measure the angle from here, this point, to this point, and dimension it. So I'll click on my pivot point. 
I'll come straight over here to this corner and click. Then I'll move up here to this corner and click. Now I need to move out to an area where I want to place the dimension lines and click. Now I want to move where I want to put that text that shows what that dimension is and I'll click. And I have a 31.6 degree angle from this corner to this corner. So I hope that answers your question on that. You can also of course do length dimensions by click this point, click on this point, bring it down, figure out where you want the text and how far away you want your dimension lines from the vector you're measuring and click. And there we go. So I hope that helps you on that score. <laughs> so I, I very rarely use any kind of dimensioning um, there have been times where I've needed to dimension something like that to send somebody, but, um, you know, it, it, it's not very common at all. So was, was that what you were asking about Jack, um, Jeff, I'm not very good on the fly like that. I like to have stuff set up and be ready to go. So I can go, oh, you want to know about this? And then just turn it on and off we go. But when I have to invent something to try to come up with an example, it doesn't work so good. <laughs> so, yeah, Jeff, that is not for setting an angle. That's just for dimensioning an angle. For just, you know, someone may want to know what uh, the angle is between two points. You know, and that's fine. So, okay. Um, wow, it's already been a half an hour. I think I'm going to go ahead and um, cut this short and um, be done with it and uh, just say thank you to everybody. Um, we are fine. We are safe. No concerns here. We don't take things for granted, though, because you never know what the weather is going to do. We have all of our important stuff gathered and we're ready to bug out at a moment's notice. We have uh, two, uh, three avenues of escape out of here. So we're all fine and dandy and can jump at a moment's notice. Um, another, you're taught here during the summer, you keep your gas tank full and, um, you know, be ready to move at a moment's notice because you never know what nature's going to do. So, uh, let me uh, just say thank you very much, all my friends and family here on the West Coast. Um, stay safe, y'all. This too shall pass. Uh, hearts and prayers go out to everybody who have uh, suffered loss. And uh, just hope everybody, we pull together, we can pull through just about anything. So, um, with that in mind, um, I see Tony, you, Sony, Tony Santangelo, you got in quick enough. Quick question, Bob CNC E4 recommend, recommendation for new home hobby. I would recommend you get on Facebook and go to the Bob CNC Facebook group. That is the official support community for the Bob CNC. I am a member and um, they got a good group of people over there and they know what they're talking about. My opinion, I've never been in the same building with the Bob CNC. I don't see anything inherently wrong with the design. Personally, I don't like drive belts for that long of an axis. Um, drive belts on a... Um, on something like a rotary axis or a uh, rack and pinion system, that's fine with me. But uh, as far as for linear motion, I prefer lead screw or rack and pinion. Lead screw, ball screw, or rack and pinion. Because there's a, just a lot of problems with drive belts. Just my opinion. It is a good machine. And a lot of people do a lot of amazing stuff with them. 
but uh, I've never been in the same building with one. So I couldn't advise you yes, no, or maybe. So with that, let me just say thanks very much for uh, taking the time to spend part of your Sunday with me. And uh, thank you for all the uh, well wishes and hope to have a video next week. Let's hope things calm down a little bit and I can get outside and do something. So until then, y'all take care. Have a good day. Thank you.